Hello, my friends. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this new episode of Sotorial Talks. We continue our series of discussion with Justin Fitzpatrick, a.k.a. the shoe snob. Uh, well, to be honest with you, he, he visits very rarely France. So we have him, we, we caught him, and we want him to stay with us. And we're going to produce as many videos as we can. No, actually, three videos is already a long conversation. Once again, you may not know that we are recording these interviews uh, directly after the other one. So we've been discussing on this set for, I would say, two or three hours already. Yeah, at oh. least. Yeah, yeah, it didn't seem too long. No. Well, we enjoyed ourselves. Quick. Okay, so today we're going to do a session of question and answers because as we have one of the biggest, the most interesting specialist experts on the shoes, uh, on the quality shoes world in our home, we're going to take advantage of his presence to maximize his presence here and to ask him a few questions that we receive constantly, whether on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, even on by mail, people are asking us a lot of questions. So I have, oh, I want to say something like 10 questions. Um, to, to share with you and I'm very um, intrigued and, and I can't wait to have your answers to that. So the first one is that, <laughs> this is a funny question, somebody says, what is going on with all these made-to-order offerings? Because you can see it everywhere. Everybody is pretending to make uh, made-to-orders. I mean, many people do actually. So what's going on on this market? So what happened was, and I'm pretty sure it stems almost exclusively from one company uh, outside of most brands having a made to order offering. But now you see tailors with made to order shoes and guys who right. launched a brand yesterday with made to order shoes. And you've never heard of these people, but they have made to order shoes. And um, what happened was there was a very smart smart in terms of business mm -hmm. company called Bespoke Factory out yeah, of, of course. Spain. We, should, we, should, we see them everywhere, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they are essentially is very intelligent IT guys who mm -hmm. created a system whereby they could pool together the resources from the town that they're from, okay. which is a factory town that has factories and every kind of shoe there is. Yes, Almansa in Spain, we can Almanza say it, right? Spain. close to Albacete. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think maybe they even work with other factories in other towns. But the thing with the Spanish is they're not so good at marketing themselves like the Italians are. Mm -hmm. And so there's all this production in Spain, but previously nobody went to Spain. Spain's becoming more and more sought after for people starting brands, also of because course. they have a very easy barrier to entry. They're a little bit more loose and will make shoes just like that. Mm -hmm. So Bespoke Factory found a way for everybody to, for anybody, not everybody, for anybody to be able to create a shoe brand remotely with a computer. Okay. And that's it. Yeah. And, and that's the, the smart business side of it. Mm. And you so go to be, in. So to be clear, I'm here. I want to, to create the Hugo Jacome shoe brand. Yeah. I go through them. It's a, it's a platform, basically. It's a platform. And they, I buy probably the software. So that people can choose the leather. But if you look at, I, we already noticed it. Mm. Everybody's using pretty much the same software. So yeah. it's just the brand is different, but it's pretty much the same offering. So I can basically overnight mm. create my brand Exa and start to sell. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I'm not going to say that I've gone and really delved into this, but I, I do know many brands that use it. So I think it's as easy as you just choosing what they have to offer. Of course. But I think you if you have the capability in your your mind to create new things, you can also try your own stuff. But mm. I think the majority of yeah. when a tailor does it, they're not thinking about shoe design. So they're just saying, uh, I like that model. Let's put my name in that. And okay. here's my new brand. Okay. okay, uh, okay. Funny so enough. So I could say on one side, Justin, let's be honest with each other. On one side, okay, we understand that um, um, working like you since uh, a decade on this, trying to to learn everything about it and putting your hands really on the production to have distinctive models, make the difference with that. But at the same time, if people uh, can be introduced to quality shoes through this channel, it's not so bad for the market. What's your mm. opinion? You understand we have to be measured in our opinion on that. I understand that from, from a pure 
shoe uh, professional, it sounds a little bit, you know, uh, kind of not fooling people, but a little bit bizarre, you know, that to create a brand like that. Yeah. But on the other hand, it may be an entry door for future customers for you. I don't know. No, I mean, at, at its heart, I, I, I appreciate the idea. I mm -hmm. think they were smart businessmen. Yes. And, and I, I like that it allows somebody to easily start a, a line because before stuff like this, it was very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> very you difficult. went through all of it. And you? I went through all of it. Yes. What I don't like is every 15 different brands with the same shoe yeah. claiming this, claiming that, yes. different prices, I different. Understand. And you start to confuse and hurt the industry because mm. this guy says, my handmade shoe, $800. This other guy is more honest and says, my Goodyear welted shoe, $400. It's the same shoe. Yeah. And you have two different what kind of shoe, what kind of price. Yeah. And that, hurt, that confuses people. And on top of that, may I add you, I 100% follow you on that. Mm. I think the worst thing on all that is um, the abuse of semantic. Mm. I got people speaking about bespoke shoes. Mm -hmm. We all know what a real bespoke shoe is. Yeah. Uh, this is something totally out of this world. And I think we should try to protect the real bespoke shoemakers uh, that are doing real bespoke shoes uh, there are very few now on the planet. Thank God we have Japan because Japan mm -hmm. is still very active on this field. But even in France, there are only a few, a handful of them really here, there. So I think that the confusion is also surfing on the sartorial wave and the bespoke n name. And we've been fighting with Sonia against this. Uh, to say to we, we recorded a series on how to name the thing. And I think mm. the first word bespoke is the same problem in tailoring. Yeah. People yeah. speak about bespoke, even if it's machine made in industrial factory. Mm -hmm. There's, we have nothing against machine made in industrial factory, but don't call it bespoke. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, um, that's the reason why you're right. And then we see all these brands overnight. So which advice will we give to the people when they really want to go there is to check if the company is a little bit more installed in, 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 their, in their market? What would give you a, as an advice? I mean, I would love to see if the bespoke factory did. I know, I don't even know if this is possible, but to have some kind of strict regest, suggested retail price so that there's not the same shoe in the market with seven different price tags. Yes, yes. Because... I mean, I guess you can't really control this because it's no different than buying from a factory. Anybody can put their own price, but when it's the exact same shoe, it's just tough, you know, and, the, mm. and I don't know. I don't know the solution. I mean, at the end of the day, personally, I believe if you are going to be tricked, yeah. it's partly your fault. You mm. know, you have to do your due diligence. You have to understand are these really shoe people or yeah. do they just buy a shoe and slap a label on it? Mm. And if you fall for their quick words and fancy talk at the end of the day, you only have yourself to blame. Okay. Wise words. Uh, yeah. We can say on this channel, this is transparency. We tell the, the truth about that. So, well, my advice will be go to Justin, go to Septième Largeur, go to Carmina, go to the people that we know and they've been, uh, and go to the Shoe Snob blog. I mean, you've been pretty much, you are the directory almost mm -hmm. of all the people who have re a real product. And this is a, a very, very good advice. Second thing, okay, well, that's another one, which is a lot, we receive this a lot. What is the reality of a made to order time frame? Because some people believe that, you know, you just choose the, the leather and this, and they say maybe in two, three weeks it's gonna be made. No. This is not exactly how it works. No, I mean, the reality is, there's so many variables, but uh, you know you have some makers that can make you in eight weeks, and some that promise f uh, 16 weeks, and some that take up to a year. And a lot of it depends on the size of the factory, yeah. the uh, the the amount of handwork and detailing, leather availability. So people just automatically assume everything is always available, ready to go, and it's just not the reality, especially after the pandemic, hmm. where tanneries stop carrying a lot of stock. And so, you know, for example, in the factory that I use, because a lot of times I tell somebody around four months and they gasp like I'm telling them <laughs> thir 30 years. Yes. And then the reality is it's not that a shoe takes four months. No shoe takes four months. You can make a shoe in, in 48 hours if you really want to rush it. Hmm. Um, but the, it's all about systems and processes, you know. So some factories are smart, I think, 
and I don't know for a fact, but I think like TLB and Carmina, who yep. are, sp I know Carmina is a larger Spanish factory. Mm. It's I in the Mallorca. In Mallorca. Yeah, and yeah. TLB, who are a smallish Spanish factory, mm -hmm. they quote something like six to eight weeks, which is very rare in European shoemaking. Most okay. Europeans is four months plus. Yes. And I think they are smart because they see the value of made to order. And I think they probably created made to order sections inside their factory, people mm -hmm. that dedicate themselves to the made to order. Yeah, because a big factory, in reality, they hate made to order. They yeah. want an order for a thousand shoes of the same black shoe mm -hmm. that they don't have to think about. It just turn, churns it out. But with made to order, you got to think about the leather, grab the leather, cut the leather. Now you got to follow this one pair around the production of a hundred thousand a year through a factory where there's mess everywhere and stuff everywhere. Yeah. And so a lot of it is just the process, you know, I place the order. Maybe they don't look at the order for two weeks because that's just the way they work. Of course. They look at the order, then they send it to the people for the leather. Now they check, do we have the leather? If they don't have the leather, they now have to order the leather. Mm. Now they have to wait for the tannery to supply the leather before they can go to the next round. Etc. Et Once cetera. they get, yeah, eh, yeah, and, yeah, then, and so it takes time and it's not shoes really take that much time, but processes take that much time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I placed the order today. Oh, I'm at the front of the line. No, you're at the back of the line. <laughs> of course. There's a hundred other people waiting for their shoes just yeah, like you. Course. And so I think a lot of people... And, uh, you know, I like to call it the, you know, the Amazon mentality or whatever, where people just expect these instant results. You know, Amazon, you, you place an order and the next day you have it. It's, like, no, it it's so rare like in it. the real yeah. world, you know. That's right. People actually. just expect everything mm. like that. But especially in European manufacturing, things don't, they don't move as quick. Yeah. And, and yeah. So I think but at the same time, this is where I'll, among the best shoes are made in the world. Yeah. So it's uh, you have to work. This is just a message of patience yeah. and don't want to talk. Well, let's say that we'd say that an average reasonable uh, delay will be four months. Something mm. like that is reasonable. Four months is four like month? the, the average standard. Okay. And it can take longer if there's leather delays. Some people don't realize shoemaking yeah. things happen. Your shoe can break when you last it. Yeah. It can split the, the toe. Yeah. And then mm. you got to start or again. Or there's another solution. Uh. If the people are ready to put $2,500, that's another game, right? Yeah. 2500 I suppose at St. Crispin in Romania, they mm. can craft a shoe from A to Z, but it's mm. 2000 plus. That's yeah. another market. Yeah. Maybe the same at Paolo's Cafara. Even it's at Paolo, the, the delays can be long also. Mm. But if you order a Norwegian stitch at $3,000, yeah. uh, maybe you can be a little bit on top of the list, but yeah. not for 500, 600, 800 shoes, under 1,000. Well, this is a good answer. So people, my friends, just be patient, you know? And on top of that, if you're a shoe lover, just try to respect also the craftsmanship and uh, you can't be like that. But yes, of course, we all like, we don't like Amazon per se. Actually, we don't really like them, but we like the speed of Amazon. Sometimes with Sonia, we can't believe we, we order at five o'clock in the afternoon and then the next morning it's here, even in France. Mm. I know the US is quite normal, but in France it's not normal. Mm. But anyway, so you understand, ladies and gentlemen, it's just, we don't live, we are speaking about quality shoes, there are gesture, there are supply chain issues, there are, you know, uh, the availability of leather. So you just have to be a little bit patient and always try to go to the real people who are making shoes since a while. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't go to new people, but it's better to put, be safe with your money and encourage people who are r the real deal in this market. Another one. What is going on with the quality of leather these days? Is it getting better? Is it dropping? Because it's always kind of an issue for the people. They're a bit of concern, specifically when they start really to be interested in shoes. Mm. Uh, people are a little bit stressed about the quality of leather. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I don't think the quality of leather is or ever will be the same as maybe it was 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I... I think people should start to wrap their head around that because it, I don't think it will get better. Um, with the rise of veganism, with leather uh, seats in cars, you know, back in the 70s, cars used polyester and all these things, yes. and, and, but, and not leather unless you were buying a really expensive car, you got That's leather. That's right. But now it's standard for cars to have leather seats. That's right. And the car industry is much bigger than the shoe industry. So mm. they get the first pick. And then you have the big conglomerate 
French houses of who course. get the second pick and of buy course. everything. Yeah. And then the more vegetarians and vegans there are, the more the less demand there are for cows. The less demand there are, the less amount of leather. Then the good stuff gets taken first. And what's left over for the beautiful shoe industry mm -hmm. is the, the slim pickings. Yes. And so now you can buy selections of first grade and you have veins and stretch marks and blemishes all over the hide. It's not this flawless, beautiful hide that you used to get 20, mm. 30 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah. And, and I know harder. that uh, even for the bespoke maker, the people who are doing pairs one by one, yeah. they have a lot of trouble to find good leather yeah. because uh, as you can see, well, I mean, the, the, the French luxury group are also a little bit part of this game yeah. because they are buying, buying all the tanneries. And, and they're bagging all the tanneries on top of that. They, they own the production tool. Yeah. So that's going very far. And I remember my dear friend Stefan who passed away uh, a few months ago. Um, um, and uh, Stefan was uh, telling me here at this table, mm. uh, one year and a half ago, he said, this is becoming extremely complicated. Yeah. Oh, no, you can imagine for him, he was buying, he was looking for one hide, yeah. you know, of alligator or whatever. He said, I'm, I'm not, not only I'm not first in line, but I'm very far. So they have to go. It's not easy. And it, it's the same even for big factories now, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's the same problem. Yeah, because, you know, the, the pecking order of my factory is very low on the list of grand scale companies. You yes, know? yes. And, and it's really, you know, mon money talks. Yes, <laughs> okay. But at the same time, what I see here on my table is still very, very decent leather. It's great leather. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, of course, we, we work hard to, to do the best we can. But even at my price point, you have to make allowances, you know. So when I check a shoe, I make sure the toe is nice and clean. Maybe you have a little vein on the heel, but I have to swallow that. You can't think you get in perfection for five, mm. six, seven hundred dollars because it uh, doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. If you want them to be that price, mm. then it can almost not be perfect because to get perfect means you are making a lot of waste. Yeah. Because you are throwing away Absolute. unperfect. Absolutely. And then your shoes become two thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember very well uh, um, something that I witnessed with Sonia in catering in the Gaziano Girling. You know this factory better mm -hmm. than me. And uh, Tony putting his hand on a big hide, mm. you know, and he said, "Ah, oh, we're going to cut here." Mm. Oh, we're going to cut there. So there's a lot of waste. Yeah. But it's bespoke shoes. So it was, it's a different game, of yeah. course. But it's, uh, it's very, um, well, I mean, and it's, it, it, it gives me an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to maybe uh, re-educate a few people on that because we receive things that are, oh, you can't wear leather, you know, you know, it's all this vegan movement. I have nothing about veganism. After all, you eat what you want and you take care of your health the way you want. Everybody can have his conviction. It mm. doesn't matter really to me and I respect that. However, it's good to know that um, uh, leather, it's good to remind that leather for shoes are, are a sub-product of s a slaughter rooms. Yeah. And it's very important that basically we don't kill a cow each time we make a shoe. We are uh, recuperating uh, the skin and not even first in line because the, the car industry is first in line and then the big luxury group are second in line and then only us, if I may say, are third in line. So. The car is long dead, ladies and gentlemen. It's not, we're not slaughtering cows to have mm. the hide. And so, it's so sometimes it's good to put a little bit back of, of a reason in the middle of mm. these kind of debates because uh, people are going a little bit, same thing for the wool, mm. sheep. Yeah. We don't kill sheep to do wool. Mm. Okay, we can braid them a little bit, can be a little bit extreme, it can be very heavy, you know, this kind of breeding of, of specif specific sheep. Okay, on this I can I can hear the critics, but globally, people uh, well, we don't really kill animals to make shoes or to make suits. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's a sub-product yeah. of a long chain. So, just for un your understanding, and once again, I have nothing against veganism. I have nothing against this movement. But no problem with me. Mm. But it's good sometimes to put a little bit of reason in the middle mm. of the debate. Next um, question. Okay, well, you know, I love shoes. Mm. I am a little bit obsessed with narrow waists, mm. okay? Well, I can go sometimes even extreme in my case and rounded, narrow waist, you know. So the waist, for those who may not know, it's this part of the shoe, okay? Me personally, when I go, uh, you know, a little bit crazy, I like when it's extremely narrow mm. and rounded. 
Um, mostly in bespoke shoemaking, you can go really far on that with the hand. And so what are, in your opinion, as an expert, the pro and the cons of narrow waists? What's your opinion on that? Well, as far as pros go, yeah. there is no functional pro. It's it's purely aesthetic. Yeah, it's it is. It's purely to show the, the level of craftsmanship the shoemaker possesses and the fine details they can create. Yes. The cons, the only thing I can really think of is, you know, just less volume underneath your foot mm -hmm. will equate to less support for your arch and yes. your foot because all your weight is going down and that region is right where your arch is. Mm. Now, one could argue a good arch support inside the sh the leather between the lining and the upper can yes. counteract. That's, that's true, actually. It's true, yeah. but it's rare that most shoes offer that, mainly bespoke shoes. Mm. Um, but still, it's you, you kind of need both, so you don't want the waist to be too uh, narrow. And I'm sure ladies might experience this with their their types of shoes because yes, they have yes, very yes, narrow course. and I'm sure they don't always feel so supported when they walk. Well, like you can twist your ankle very yeah. quickly with yeah. this kind of thing. Well, in, in one word, if I, if I translate this in very, in a, in a, uh, I'll just say that in a, in a line, it will be if you're a, a big guy, mm. very tall, quiet with a heavy figure, don't go for narrow waist. No, basically. You, you need that support. Yes. Yeah, yes you need yes, a full yes. sole underneath you. Yeah. Right. But, also, I may add something. I think that it's about aesthetics. Of course, it's purely cosmetic. It's to show and to respect the craftsman. But also, I, but it's just my, my opinion. Mm. It's, it has a tendency of elongated your, your, the vision, the visually, silhouette. your, yeah. your, your, your foot. Mm. This is what I think about it. And sometimes, me, I reach my limit one day when I said, okay, it's going a little bit too far. Mm. So I now I'm more reasonable, darling. Is that correct? Yeah. Sonia said, yes, I'm, it was the same with my lapels. <laughs> I went very, very far, but it's a little bit, I mean, honestly, it's just for me, it's, aesthetics is important, right? It's, uh, this is why we In love style, shoes. And yeah. it, exactly, it's stylish for some. But yeah, uh, you're right. If you are new and you, you know, don't go too narrow. In any case, if you go ready to wear even MTO, you will not find extremely narrow waist no. anyway. Okay, uh, another one. Okay, oh, we discussed this one day with uh, Paolo Scafora back in the years. Breaking in your shoes. What do you suggest? And what is, in your opinion, the duration of a uh, average time to break in your shoes because some people specifically in America oh they say oh it's too narrow but yeah. they didn't give the time to the leather to adapt and to yeah. the shoe so what are your advices on that well I think I just first have to educate on what happens in a Goodyear welted shoe yes and I think most people don't realize this so you know, I'm not talking about Blake or cemented, just welted shoes because mm -hmm. they are the ones that usually feel stiff and that people have a hard time breaking in. Yeah. So first and foremost, one of the features of Goodyear welted shoes is the fact that they have the cork footbed. Yes. And that cork, just by nature of gravity, you're going to sink into it. So yes. your foot is going to mold to the insole and sink into that corked bed. Now this is going to happen about for three quarters of your foot because there's no there's not a lot under the heel yes um that people don't realize but those little amounts make worlds of difference so mm -hmm. when you sink into your footbed you gain more volume it's the same thing with socks a thicker sock and a thinner sock can make a half size difference All and right. see these little these little changes create worlds of difference so when a welted shoe is new, it's stiff, the, everything is fresh, you haven't sunk in, you haven't softened the leather. When you wear the shoe, your feet are sweaty, it's hot, it starts to mold and open the leather. The leather's tight because the pores are closed. When the pores start opening, hmm. you start molding that leather and it inevitably stretches in the places you're putting pressure on it, i.e. the sides of the hmm. forefoot. Okay. And so by nature, you're going to gain more space. How long that takes, it's very difficult. Mm. I would be lying if I could give a time frame. Mm. I can break a shoe in the first day wearing it. Yes. Another person could wear the same shoe and they think it takes weeks. Yes. But it just depends mm. because I've been wearing welted shoes nonstop for how long. I can share with you what Paolo Scafara was, his estimation, you know, 
a Napolitan nose estimation. He yeah. said 24 hours of yeah. actual wear. Yeah, actual wear. Actual yeah, wear. Yeah. That would be None like three, four days. Walking in the house. Three, four <laughs> days. Yeah. Uh, 24 hours will be, if you wear your shoes 10 hours a day, will be, yeah, yeah, three, four, let's say three, four days. And I have to say, that's being generous because Paolo Scofora shoes are so comfortable. Fantastic. You can bend the Goodyear welted shoe in half like it's nothing. That's correct. My shoes are not that soft. Yeah. It's a midway, and it depends because some British makers are very stiff. And very. It take forever to mm. feel like breaking in, mm. whereas some... I use an Italian chestnut tan sole that is flexible. So for me, I can break it in the first day. Yeah. So yeah. what things you can do, I think a lot of people have the, the hardest times with the heel. Yeah. And, uh, and then in the forefoot region. Yeah. So it's mainly the heel. Yeah. The heel, yeah. basically inside the heel is a, what's called a counter. And that's a stiff piece of leather that is meant to create the shape of the heel. So that leather is really hard when the shoe is new mm. and it can cause you problems if you have heels that are sensitive. Yeah. So one way you can change that is you can manually break down the heel counter oh. and you can basically just start to bend it at all points. And so you're manually softening that inside leather oh. that is I was stiff. stressed when we were doing this on the I new know, show. You it's know? okay. I would say, what is he doing I'm with this shoe? But it's, fi it's fine, It's right? a sample. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can bend it and you're not going to break your shoe because your shoe is going to be good quality. So you bend that heel counter and you start to just make that leather inside <laughs> more flexible so that it already feels like you've broken it in. Mm. Always oh, wow. the best breaking will be a natural one, but you can do certain tricks. In the forefoot, there's a trick, and it's hard to show because I don't have an instrument here, but yeah. like the end of a broom, you stick it inside, and you, and you rub the inside leather here to open this up. And oh, you, wow. you, you do some good force, and you can open up. So guys that have bunions or have sensitive parts here, you can manually stretch that. Oh, wow. That's good. Oh, just for the sake of what we are looking at, people, before we receive Rotten Tomato, these are plastic shoe horns because, not shoe horns, uh, trees, because it's traveling, it's for traveling, right? Yes. Yeah, because, uh, honestly, because, okay, it's always better to have a, a wood shoe tree, but uh, Justin is coming from New York with a lot of shoes, <laughs> and if you will have only shoe trees in, in, in uh, wood, no. you will have to pay excessive Double. luggage, like uh, <laughs> a lot more. And no, no, that's a little trick. Don't use a uh, plastic um, uh, trees all the time, but for traveling, well, if you can afford bespoke shoe trees with, uh, you know, very light one, Followed, of yeah. course, but it's sometimes double the price of, uh, of one shoe here. Mm. But uh, this one is a plastic, and I must admit, I use them for traveling. That's just fantastic. Yeah, you know, to keep the shape of the shoe. So, break in. You had some very wise, I've never seen anybody doing this with the back of the shoe. Mm. I was a little bit stressed <laughs> and I'm losing my next question because I was too stressed on what you were doing. But there are good advices. Well, basically, I think there's one advice we can even give to the people specifically in America is that if you don't feel immediately comfortable in a shoe, don't be so, you know, just wait a little bit because yeah. this is leather. Yeah. And it's not something which is totally, it's a living matter, so it has to adapt to your foot. Exactly. And uh, don't, but the other advice would be don't uh, take, because some people, it's the same for suits. They take two wide mm. sizes, and then the, you have an, a, a bigger problem on yeah. this side, yeah. because, uh, you know, uh, it's better to be a little bit, uh, a bit more, less room at the beginning, yeah. and it will adapt to your, sh to your yeah. fit. But the reverse is impossible. No, it's you the don't same. Shrink it. Like in the seventies, everybody wanted to have XL uh, suits, and then with a very, very low arm holes. Mm -hmm. And then the result is that when you do this, uh, your whole suit was doing this. Okay, <laughs> so just it's always the same thing. Dress, know your size, mm -hmm. and then make experimentation on that. But thank you for this very good advice. Uh, next one is that. What is because I'm discovering the question just now, live. What is a fiddleback? Give us a few terms to know. What is a fiddleback? So the fiddle, a fiddleback is a feature of the sole's waist. Yes. Um, in Italian, you'll hear them say the viola. Yes. So the fiddleback is basically where you shape the waist here on the edges and you tighten it and you create what looks like a V with a 
a stem. They say a viola. A viola, exactly. <laughs> it, so it, it so looks Italian. like the like a uh, a violin. Okay. So it's like the shape of a violin in the waist, okay. and generally you find it on a narrow waist, mm -hmm. not to be confused with the beveled waist, which is the edge of the waist as opposed to the bottom of the waist. Okay. This is something I've had and to argue the about. And the piece of wood or leather or whatever you put inside, what's the name in English? We say cambrion in the French. The shank. The shank. Yeah, but this has nothing to do with that. Now, a shank that is a big plastic shank yes. can give the aesthetic of a fiddleback, but it's not a real one because oh, okay. a fiddleback needs to be created. Mm. This is what Gatsiano and Gerlin coined on their shoes with the and they highlighted it with the color change. Wow. So that's the fiddleback is that V-like structure shape with a narrow and pointed uh, line at the center. Wow, wow, wow. We are in expert mode, ladies and gentlemen. You are from the video game generation. It's not a beginner, beginner mode. We are <laughs> expert Extra plus mode, mode yeah. right now. Okay, um, just two, three more to go. Are tassel loafers coming back? Well, that's a good question. Well, personally, Justin, I, I only one tassel loafer. I don't know if I'm very classic on this one, but I remember I was interested in the Alden mm. tassel loafer. I think it was in Cordovan leather or something like that. Is is it still a classic in your idea? Or yeah, I, I think that's the Alden, the Crockett and Jones, these classic tassel loafers that have stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. You know, when I lived in in England. Brown suede tassel loafer was yes. quite, by Crockett, was quite, you saw that a lot. Yes. Um, the brown leather one as well. And I think with the emergence of less having to wear a suit to yes. work and maybe breaking up with a jacket and trousers or jeans, mm -hmm. that's why I think tassel loafers are having a, a resurgence. Because I think they look nice when they're kind of dressed down, but still elegant. Mm. So with a jacket, a, a shirt, you don't have to have the tie. You have some trousers and a pair of tassel loafers. I think it's a, a nice look. Maybe uh, I'm going to try one day. Hey, I'm 60 year old. Why not? Why not? I have a few <laughs> shoes in my closet, but I didn't have. Actually, I remember Mathieu Price here at this table throwing us uh, one of the good sage was this tassel loafer with a very thick command mm. sole. Mm -hmm. But I like this idea because it allows the young people who are, don't want to go to sneakers, yeah. but at the same time have a little bit of style and mm. very comfortable. Yeah. And that's, uh, well, that's something we can all consider. Okay, last question. Give us, oh wow, that's a good one. Give us three, the three easiest things to do to make your shoes last long. Okay. Well, that's a very good, first of all, I give, well, you, you give three, I give one before, uh, buy good shoes. I'm <laughs> sorry to say that, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, it may sound a little bit st stupid, but this is the thing. Wow. Buy good shoes are real shoemakers, and by definition, is just my take on that. Mm. If I'm honest with you, I always ask the people, buy shoes at a shoemaker, buy suit at a suit maker, mm. and buy shirts at a shirt maker, because all these global brands... This is, at the end, what is a little bit difficult for us. And I, as long as I will live, I will always try to defend that mm. because shoes is a specialty. And sometimes people, and we explain to you with this MTO program, which is more has to do with IT than craftsmanship, but still even though there are factories, bona fide factories behind, it's better than, it's, uh, it's always better to go to the specialist yeah. of it. So, but that's my first uh, advice. But what are your advice to make your shoes last longer? I think I have to just quickly play on that because I remember you saying that and then I think I remember a comment making a good point. Yes. Because technically, one could say that I'm not a shoemaker because I don't make the shoe. Yeah, well, I mean, you're a so shoemaker for me in the, in of the sense of the Of course, you time. know yeah. that. Yes. But I wanted to clarify, I think what you mean is don't go to Hugo Boss to buy exactly. shoes. Exactly. Don't That's go I mean. to big brands that don't specialize, that exactly. didn't put their heart and soul in a product. Exactly. You know, and me, I don't own the factory, but I go to the factory and I work directly with them to make the shoes exactly how I want them. Yes, of course. And there are other people like me, like Norman, uh, like Matthew, like the people, they don't own the factory, but they make it to their specifications with their mind because mm -hmm. they care about it. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Hugo bosses of the world. And yeah, the yeah. Hugo boss, or you can do it in reverse. You know, uh -huh. you don't buy a suit 
at uh, Carmina. No, they don't sell suits, hopefully. Sell. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's less true in the, the other way around because yeah. they really don't do this. Nobody. Mm. Well, I mean, Camper, for example, they were in Mallorca, very successful, let's say, laser shoes, let's say, la laser shoes, like the, the mm. more sports shoes. Mm. And they were trying to sell, they were saying like blouson and mm. stuff like that. So my point is just maybe I'm an old fashion guy, but no. I think always go to the specialist. The specialist and even in France, way. we yeah. say, uh, go and buy your meat to the butcher, mm. not to the supermarket. But that's yeah. another way of thinking the world. And mm. I think we got a few more and more actually mm. to resist to this globalization. But give us your advices to make your shoes last longer. Well, my first one is going to be as obvious as yours, which is, you know, buy good shoes. And my one is be aware. <laughs> Just be aware. Yeah. So... Part of the problem is, is us. We destroy our shoes because we're not aware of the puddle we're stepping in, of spilling the alcohol we just spilled on, yes. of hitting our shoe on the corner of a table, yes. and we have a gash in our heel now. Yeah. That's the thing is you got to be aware. Now, that's not tiptoe your way around life, but mm. be aware of your surroundings. Leather is not uh, uh, unbreakable. Yes. It, it battles every day with concrete and concrete is going to win that battle every time. So mm -hmm. be smart about, be smart about it. Wood is stronger than leather. All these things that leather can interact with is mainly stronger. It So don't kick that. Don't hit your toe. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost. But actually being aware, I never, I, I never, I was never aware, <laughs> I can't say it now, of, of being aware, but you're right. Yeah. It's just a way that you don't walk in leather shoes, even just by respect, it can change your attitude. Doesn't mean you have to, to become a tight ass and no. just, you know, do like that all the day. No, no but it means that you, you're aware of your posture almost and yeah. who you are. And yeah, that's, I never huh? thought about that. This is a very good idea. And, uh, but you can still run, of course, if you have to. But it's yeah. better to well, have a training I'll shoes if you run. I'll tell you a quick funny story. The first, one of the first ever... The first ever Gaziano shirt, girling shoe I got yeah. was a made to order that they made for me of the Astaire model, which was one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. And it was my first like high end shoe. Yes, yes, of course. And I was living in London and I put it the first day and I go out to the bar that night and I and, I, and I'm very aware <laughs> of my shoes. Of course. And You're I'm aware of the price of I'm the shoes. And I'm standing at the bar. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, I got to be careful of the shoes. I'm drinking over the bar, so I'm not going <laughs> to spill. The next day, I'm th I, so I get home, like, okay, great, it was a good night, nothing happened. Yeah. I wake up, I grab my shoes, and I see a slit on the toe, like an inch and a half long. I don't know how many centimeters that is, three well, centimeters yes. long. And I'm like, what? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. And you see, I just, I think that's a, a part of being aware. And even I felt I was aware, yeah. I probably kicked underneath and you the still, bar after you the You still fifth don't know, drink. you still don't, you never figure out what happened. No. Mm. No idea. It wasn't there when I put them on the, that day, but it was there the next morning. Mm -hmm. I have an explanation. Maybe um, you had a mice in your house or you <laughs> yeah. had a, yeah. or, or mice and said, mm, I'm going to eat a Gaziano and girling shoe or whatever. Yeah. Well, well, but at the same time, mm. may I add something on the reverse, mm. on the B face of this explanation? I said, but at the same time, a little scratch, a little something is the same, I think, for tables. Tell the story yeah, a little true. bit. So don't yeah. be too much, you know, your shoes are not going to be perfect. Exactly. Mm, specifically, well, the first couple of days, mm. most of the time, mm. this is where you get used to have a little scratch. So it's part of the story. Mm. And then now with the patina and with the learn how to maintain your shoes and maybe you can make them uh, last longer. So yeah. one or two so, other advices? Yeah. Second one, shoe trees. Yes, obviously. of course. Wooden shoe trees. If you can get lasted, of course, this is the best. Is it's the not 1,000% necessary, but the tighter the fit, the better. Of course. The reason being is it helps to not allow the creases that we create when we walk to set into the leather because those creases create weak points. Okay. When there's humidity or extreme heat, those creases can crack. So having that shoe tree constantly pushing out those creases helped mm -hmm. to not allow that. Okay. N coupled with the third thing, which is clearly a good shoe care regimen. Yeah. So conditioner and polish, conditioner is needed. A lot of people don't realize. Shoe conditioner is like lotion to your skin. If your skin is exactly. dry, it needs lotion. Yeah. Same thing with conditioner and leather. When it's dry, it cracks, then you have to put chapstick or lotion or whatever. 
no difference. So mm -hmm. with leather, you need the conditioner to help the dry, wrinkled areas, the shoe trees to push it out, and then the polish to protect it. And yeah. then you have exactly all the things you need and then you don't need to become a crazy addict and to shine your shoe every uh, every other day and no. to do no and actually a conditioner we, we we did record in french a few days ago uh an episode on that mm. and we were talking about the sapphire brown you know it's french of course, of course. Oh, uh, oh, hallelujah cocorico we say in <laughs> france like the like the rooster ooh, ooh, mm. ooh you know because we are very proud of Safir, which are beautiful products of very course good. among the best in the world and they were explaining that conditioner and moisturizing the leather is probably the most important gesture yeah. because after wax it's more like cosmetic but the real maintenance of a shoe go through moisturizing and when you buy a little pot of moisturizer it lasts yeah. years yeah literally. because you should use it sparingly not caking it on yeah because then you're going to ruin your shoe yeah because you're going to saturate the yeah. shoe and the, it yeah. has the reverse effects you know exactly if you put too much exactly and so they were telling this as you take a little amount and really spread it so well these are the best advice we can make so well thank you justin thank you for your visit for your good advice for and for being our friends for more than a decade now My well ladies and gentlemen we have a program now but we're not going to take you with us, we're going <laughs> to share a good glass of Chablis because we are here exactly 12 kilometers, like I would say, eight miles from the town of Chablis. Mm. And I'm gonna, we're going to raise your glass to all the shoe lovers and thank you, my friend, for your thank visit. You. We appreciate, as usual. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for following us. You can, I, I never ask this, but okay, I'm in the mood today. You can like, you can subscribe, you can do whatever you want, after all. And, uh, but uh, there's one thing I would like you to do is uh, try good leather shoes and try to be a little bit more elegant in this world because beauty is ultimately what we are fighting for. See you soon, my friends. Bye-bye.